Hey everybody, welcome back to Diesel Creek. My name is Matt. As of course you guys know, I am interested in all things mechanical. The older and the odder, I guess is the word. It's not really a word. The more unique, the better, I guess. I had a couple unique mechanical oddities follow me home today, and I'm pretty excited about them. I hope you guys get a kick out of it as well. So what I have here is not one, but two Whiteman power buggies. Uh, commonly used for hauling concrete into places where you cannot get a concrete truck. Concrete buggies by themselves can be handy here and there, um, but all in all I wouldn't really normally get too excited about them. These ones, however, are really neat. So from what I can gather, these things are either from the 40s or the 50s. So they're very old, so that strikes my fancy right away. But the way they are constructed is what really intrigued me and made me have to have them. So I gave a guy 300 bucks for both of them, which I thought was a pretty fair deal. This one here needs a little bit more loving on. The engine is stuck on it, and it's got some broken wheel studs. The tires are all flat. It's banged up pretty good. But all in all, I think it could easily be fixed. It's got some extra parts in the hopper here. Hoppers. Yeah, it's not super straight, but for what it was used for, not bad. This one over here is pretty much all there, and I don't think it's going to take a whole lot to get this one going, hopefully. Look, it even came with a whole hopper full of PVC fittings for, uh, like, two-inch conduit. That's exciting, because I could use that. Empty can of WD-40. Who knows what else is at the bottom of this thing? I don't even know. So that was all added bonus stuff. I mean, each one of these things is like 15 bucks, I think, last time I bought one. I'm getting a little off track here. So as I said, the unique construction is what really drew me to these things. And the unique construction is right here. So of course, this is your engine. You have a centrifugal clutch here that goes down to a drive belt. And that runs your two drive slash steering wheels. So to make this thing steer and go in reverse, you would need some sort of a fancy transmission or ruggedly simplistic design like they did right here. So I've never seen anything configured quite like this. I just thought it was so cool and so simplistic and yet functional. To make this thing steer and go in reverse, rather than getting, you know, gearboxes involved or anything like that, they just mounted the whole engine on a rotating turntable that goes with the steering wheels. So as you spin the steering wheel to make the buggy move, the entire engine assembly rotates with your drive wheels, and that's what steers you all around. Is that cool or what? The other thing that really caught my eye about these units was the floor plate here. Instead of just having like a diamond plate checker for your feet to go on, they actually cast their logo, which is a W, I think we're upside down reading it, but you know their, their logo is a W, a cursive W, and they got it cast into the floor plate. Um, so that's really neat. This is a aluminum casting by the looks of it. I have never seen anything built quite like that, so that was just really cool. And uh, luckily, I was able to make a deal and land these things. And I think this is going to be a really handy thing to have. First of all, second of all, I just think this thing's going to be fun to cruise around on places like the Steam Show think about the flea market picking you can do with this thing just cruising through a flea market throwing stuff in the hopper drive it back to your truck unload your treasures it's going to be perfect or maybe you fill the hopper up with ice and your favorite adult refreshments another great option anyways i'm excited and i want to see if we can't get the one running right away here so let's get these things pulled off of here and start working on it I'm just now really starting to take an inventory of what is in this hopper. Heck, there's almost $300 worth of conduit fittings in this hopper. We're going to have to clean these all out and organize them. 
And here's a tag for this thing. It's a BB60. I don't know what that number would indicate. Usually model numbers on equipment tend to indicate something about the capacity or the power or something like that. In this case, I have no clue what that number would mean. Well, the ADHD kicked in and I just had to clean out this tub. I couldn't stand it. But look at all the stuff we got out of here. I looked up the equivalent stuff on Home Depot's website here and we had nine of these 45 degree elbows and two and a half inch conduit and seven 90 degree elbows and two and a half inch conduit for a grand total of $154 before taxes. Not to mention all these other goodies we got. Perforated landscaping pipe, a bunch of random fittings in here, and we've got this nice little cast iron uh, drain pan. I've now officially got an ax to grind as well. Just a little bit of random garbage down in there and some nasty sludgy water that smells quite a bit, but uh, well, the hopper still holds water, so I guess that's good. Anyways, let's turn our attention to the important part now the heart of the operation, this engine. I believe it to be a Wisconsin. Um, not super familiar with any of the single cylinder models. So I guess we should just start with the basic stuff. Let's find a dipstick, check for oil. Looks like we've got an oil fill plug down here, so we'll have to rotate this engine around to get to that. She's a little low and it's really black looking oil, but there's definitely a fair amount in there. It's quite enough for us to get this thing fired up and heated up so that we can drain that oil and put some good stuff in there. I'm gonna clean off these two little casting surfaces here. That looks like a good place to cast in a serial number. So we might be able to, to identify this engine. Nothing there either. Where are you hiding engine identification numbers? So after searching around, I don't see anything else, but I also remembered that these engines usually have a big square tag right here, and I can see the rivet holes where it's supposed to be. But as you can see, it's MIA. So let's go check that other buggy and see if it has one. Dang it. All right, so after some exhausting Googling here, I guess it really wasn't that much Googling, I managed to scrounge up a spec sheet for these things. This is a DB60, not a BB60, as I think I said earlier in the video. According to the original spec sheet here, this buggy would have been equipped with a BKND Wisconsin engine spec'd at 6.8 horsepower. So I'm thinking that's what we're looking at here. So we know we've got oil now. We can turn, literally turn, our attention toward the fuel system. Under here we've got a glass sediment bowl. Oof. Definitely looks like we've got some nasty gunk in our fuel, fuel sediment bowl here. The fuel valve is off. Let's see if I can get the sediment bowl loose. This thing was stored outside for a while before I bought it, but supposedly sat indoors for most of its life. And I tend to believe that because things are coming apart rather easy here. Can you guys see that sludge layer underneath all the fuel there? Ew. We'll dump it out on this nice white pigment here so that you guys can see the nastiness. Yeah. And it is varnished up pretty good. It smells, smells pretty bad. If that's what the sediment bowl looks like, what does the fuel tank look like? There was definitely some water in there, as well as that old nasty fuel. So we're probably gonna have to drain the tank. Huh. Wow. Believe it or not, that's probably the cleanest fuel tank that I've ever gotten on anything that I'm gonna revive. It is almost empty, and it is spick and span in there. But that 
is a clean fuel tank. I'm not even going to touch that, guys. There's just a teeny little drop of fuel in there anyway, so I'm just going to put some fresh stuff in there. That'll all dilute out. It won't be a problem. Got our strainer bowl all cleaned out, so we can reinstall that now. All right. Being as that the tank is as clean as it is in there, I'm hopeful that the carburetor is uh, clean as well. It kind of looks like somebody's been through it, honestly. It's an original Zenith carburetor made in the USA, but I mean, it's cleaner than everything else around it. So I kind of feel like somebody's been in there recently. This is the age old question of do we even bother taking it apart? I'm gonna go with no right now because you know what? The fuel's clean, everything looked good in there. The carburetor on the outside appears to be super clean and fresh. If it's dirty, well, we just have to tear it apart. No sense tearing it apart to find out that we didn't need to do it. So we're gonna leave that go for now. The last thing we need to do is check for spark. So the magical little box on the side of the engine here is what produces the spark for this unit. This is an old engine, so it does not have solid state ignition. This has what is called a magneto. Basically, it generates an electrical charge, and then there's a condenser and a set of breaker points under here, just like you would have on a distributor in a car, and it sends spark up to the plug in the head. This little prong on the side here should be basically your kill switch. You push this down, and that should ground out the coil and kill the engine. We've got one loose screw here on the magneto cover. Let's just go ahead and pop it off while we're here. Have a gander in there, make sure there's nothing obviously wrong or the points aren't obviously dirty. Something else that I just thought about, even if we get this engine to run, this centrifugal clutch over here, what runs the belt down to the drive wheels, I guess there's a chance that it could be kind of stuck I don't know, I've never messed with any of these CVT systems. This had to be a pretty early pioneer of a CVT belt. I mean, if this is from the 40s or the 50s like I think it is, these CVT belt systems really didn't seem to gain popularity until well into the 70s. So there's your peek inside the magic box. As I said, this is your breaker points. They ride on this shaft right here, which is has some lobes on it, kind of like a cam. Well, they don't look terrible. We're here, we're gonna clean them up a bit. This looks like a coil up here, which has a contactor that goes to the plug wire. This is your condenser. And the magic happens back in there somewhere. And don't ask me how to explain it to you because I couldn't really tell you to be honest. Like I said, these points don't look hateful, but we'll just give them a little shine up while we're in here. Hate to put it all back together and then not have spark. Theoretically, as I do this, you might be able to see the spark. All right, we're gonna try this again. I've got a plug rigged up here. Oh yeah, look at that. I can just turn, I can snap that mag over. I guess we are almost ready to try to fire this thing up. So that is good. We got a good magneto there. We got great spark. I got, what, three things left we gotta do before we can try to start this thing. We're gonna have to put some fresh gas in it, obviously. I wanna check the oil in this. This is an oil bath air cleaner. And then the last thing is our drive down here has its own little gearbox. And I noticed when I was pulling it off the trailer that it had a place to check the oil in that. And I would assume that that just gets 90 weight in it. So we'll check that thing, make sure it's got some oil in it. I guess before we should start it too, I don't want this thing to take off on us because there's no way to completely disengage the engine from the transmission. We're going to jack it up off the ground so that uh, we don't just go careening into the Jeep or something up there. Oh, see? Glad I checked it. There's nothing in there. It has been drained out some time ago because there's not even any wet residue of oil in there. But you fill oil up until it just touches on top of this plate. There's other signs of life around here too. I noticed that this grease fitting and there's I think there's one or two other ones around here have some fairly fresh grease on them. So I think somebody started trying to revive this thing and just didn't get it running. Because the guy I bought it from said he had never seen it run. There we go. That thing's all filled up, we can install it. Should be good to go there. All right, so there's an oil fill plug right there. And I'm betting that this gearbox down here Probably saw some neglect over the years because that is not an obvious thing. 
If you think about it, it's obvious, of course, you're going to have to have lubrication for some sort of drive mechanism down here, but the average guy that's hopping on and off of this thing every day probably isn't thinking about that. They're thinking about concrete. Looks like we either need to take off this wheel or get a socket on that thing, but I think it's probably just easier to take the wheel off. Maybe this thing was fixed up and running a long time ago and then parked for a long time. I don't know. Yeah, we are full right to the top. I think somebody had to have been here before. It's been some time, but it hasn't been worked since they've been here, I don't think. I think, I think we just got to be picking up right where somebody left off many years ago. Okay, I think it's time. Let's throw some gas in this thing and see if it's gonna pop. All right, many times with these old gas engines that haven't run in quite a long time, as I suspect this one has not, I start out with chainsaw gas that's got, you know, two cycle oil mixed in it. I do that under the theory that a little bit of extra lubrication sure wouldn't hurt anything. Plus I mix up my chainsaw gas with dirt bike oil and it smells so good. All right, fuel valve's open. Our fuel strainer is quickly filling up. There's a chocolator lever right here. And you may have noticed already, but there's no recoil start on this thing like your lawnmower. You gotta actually wrap a rope around this thing and then pull it. There's also no indication of which direction to spin it. I'm like 99% sure I'm spinning it the right way, but maybe not. All right, I guess this is the big moment. You guys think it's gonna run? Contact. Nothing. Flip that choke the other way, see if we get anything. The invention of the recoil starter. That was something. That was a major, major improvement over this rope wrapping crap. Man, we are not even getting a little pop. I would think that we should be getting something here. I didn't really want to, but I'm going to go ahead and give her just a teeny little whiff from the ether bunny and see if we get something. See, that was strange. There was still nothing. <laughs> it was kind of running. Big improvement. I'll take it. You know what? I didn't check the main jet or the uh, idle jet, but this main jet feels like it is turned all the way in. So that, that would basically keep us from getting any fuel. From what I found online, our base setting for the carburetor is between three quarter and one and a quarter turns out. So what you do is you just run this needle down till it seats. Don't force it, you know, you just run it down till it touches basically. It'll snug up and that's where you stop. Note the position and then back it out so that's half, that's three quarter, that's one, and that's where I'm going to leave it right now. So that's, that's the in-between position. They said three quarter to one and a quarter, we'll go with a one, one turn out. That needle was run pretty much all the way in, so it wouldn't have been getting any fuel. It would have been completely shut off, basically. So maybe it's going to start up now. Contact. <laughs> I think we got it. Dang it. We don't got it. I'm going to give it one more go, and if that doesn't do it, then I'm going to have to bite the bullet, pull the bowl off the carburetor. But I think in order to do that, we have to remove the whole thing from the engine and we'll have to give it a good cleaning. I'm also going to turn the idle up just a little bit. See what that does. I went up a half turn there. Let's go.
Yeah, we must have something clogging up in the carburetor because I don't think we're pulling enough fuel. Carburetor's got to come off. Dang it. I thought we might get lucky this time. I turned the fuel valve on with that line disconnected just to verify that we were flowing fuel to the carburetor, and we are. One thing we might just have going on here is that the carburetor is already plum full of old fuel. The fuel that's draining out of this thing while I'm working on it smells pretty bad. It's, it's pretty varnished up, so might just need to basically flush it out. It might even be clean in there still, I don't know. But we're ready to pull the bowl and find out. Guys, drop a comment down below. Do you think this carburetor is going to be gummed up, or do you think it's probably pretty clean in there? I'm leaning towards it's going to be pretty clean. Not too bad. Not too bad at all. I don't see any bad clumps of dirt or anything. Everything looks pretty good in here. One of the float pontoons has a little bit of fuel in it, which is less than ideal. Don't want to see that really, but... If anything, that would just flood out the carburetor. It really wouldn't cause the issues that we're having here. Needle and seat look good. I think this tube right here, I always forget what it's called. An emulsion, emulsion tube maybe? But it's got teeny little orifice holes on it. And you want to make sure those things are all clean. These ones appear to be. Yeah, everything looks good in there. No need to... No need to even get anything out and clean that stuff up. It's beautiful. I wonder if it was just the carburetor was full of old crappy fuel that didn't want to light. Because it was popping as soon as we'd give it some ether. But then once the ether was completely burnt off, it was just dying out. Got one, mo one more little small orifice here that could be our issue. I can't tell if it's gummed up or not. I think that might be our issue. I think this little guy's clogged. Well, I blew it out. It's nice and clean now. We'll reinstall it put this thing back together I can't see anything else to take apart everything looks pretty good all right I got it all back together let's give this another go hopefully we did something here we are pouring fuel out of this thing now float must be hung up Come on. Now we're having the problem that the float is not shutting off the fuel from the tank. It is just allowing fuel to just flow right through it. So the bowl is full. I shut the fuel off from the tank. It'll run on that for a good little bit. And if it's running, I can turn the valve back on. Probably flood it out though. See what you'll do. That was the best it's run yet, and that was without any ether. I think we just have a bad float. I wonder if we can steal one off that other machine. Oh, actually, the guy I bought this from gave me a box of spare parts, and I think there's a carburetor in there. Well, there was a carburetor in the box, but it is completely unrelated. It looks like it goes to some Briggs & Stratton lawnmower engine junk. It definitely likes the fresh fuel a lot better. Why'd you shut off? Well, that's the longest we got it to run yet. It sounds like it runs pretty good when it's got fuel. It's just a fuel delivery issue.
guys see the clutch working there? It kicked in nicely. I think we're gonna be in business as soon as we get this carburetor sorted out. <laughs> All right, guys, I am super pumped about this thing. We are very, very close to being able to get on this thing and actually take it for a cruise because it seems that the driveline stuff all works. The carburetor is what seems to be giving us fits though. So it's getting late. I'm gonna go home and get me some dinner. Tomorrow I'm gonna come back and we're gonna put some carburetor parts in this thing. Hopefully there's good parts in that parts machine outside. Alrighty, I stole the carburetor off of that other machine outside and well, after looking it over some more, I'm pretty sure that's just a parts engine. I mean, I think the rest of the buggy it's probably savable, but I think you're going to have to find a repower unit. Finding one of these old Wisconsins is probably not the easiest thing in the world. Not to mention you're missing half of the clutch setup too on that one. So I think if we ever want to get that one running, it's probably going to get a modern engine thrown on it and a, uh, unfortunately, probably some sort of generic centrifugal clutch or CVT clutch, rather. Anyways, here's to hoping that we find a better float inside of this carburetor. There we go. Tell you what, this, this one really isn't dirty either. A teeny little bit. Not too bad at all. Hopefully this float does just that. There's nothing in it, but there was no gas in here either, so hard to say. Part of me just wonders if we should put the entire carburetor on there. So the main jet on the other unit is this T knob right here. That's the one we put an initial setting on of one turn out from the seat. The seat is a very small orifice in here and on the other one, when you run it in there, it kind of looks like it's going off center of the seat. This one definitely, just to the eyeball, looks like it's lined up better. So I wonder, if not switch out the whole carburetor, I mean, I don't see any differences on the top side, but maybe switch out the bowl and the float, and hopefully that'll help us out. The needle and seat also looks brand new on this one, but at the tip of that needle, there's a, a point and after a long time of use and especially vibration in something like this, that needle will basically just be hammering up into the seat all the time under vibration and eventually will cause a wear ring on that needle and that's what shuts off your fuel from flooding the carburetor. So once it gets a good wear ring, it's not gonna seal anymore and you'll never be able to get it to stop flowing fuel into the carb. But they both look brand new. I'm gonna tear apart the other one for comparison. All right, so we got our original carburetor torn apart here right next to the parts one. And there's definitely things that look better in the other carburetor. This float, can you guys hear the water? Well, it's not water. Can you guys hear the fuel sloshing around inside of that? One of the pontoons is compromised and allowing fuel inside of it. That's not going to help your cause. The weird thing here is that it looks like we have a brand new needle in the original carburetor. And the needle that came out of the parts machine carburetor has a teeny little bit of wear on it, but the seat in the original carburetor looks used and older, and the seat in the parts carburetor looks brand new. So I'm just gonna mix and match pieces here and get the best of everything for this carburetor, I guess. So we'll put the one with some wear in it back over there. This seat, like I said, looks perfect. Brand new, I'm matching up the numbers on them to make sure that they're both the same. Let's see, that's a 35. That's a 35, so yeah, we can just switch these right out. What that number is, is something to do with the diameter of the orifice in there. I don't know if that's 0 0.035 or what that number actually stands for, but it's a 35 seat and we can change it out. Of course, these floats, to do their job, they inherently float, I mean, as they're named. So if you have one of these pontoons that's got fuel in it, it loses buoyancy and it doesn't go up as far as it needs to to cut the fuel off. See, even like the float pin is a lot shinier out of the parts carburetor than it is from this 
one off the good machine. So we're going to go with the shiny float pin. And yeah, that it moves nice and easy. It's hard to do on this carburetor, but the way I was taught how to check the float seal is just to turn the carburetor upside down like this, and with nothing but the weight of the float sitting on the needle, you should be able to blow into the uh, fuel line into the carburetor here, and it shouldn't allow you to blow past that seat. Not a lot of clearance to do that on this one. <clears throat> but it appears to be sealed. The other thing you do, I don't have one of the little squares that they give you with the carburetor kit, but you're supposed to look at the float and make sure the float is square to the body of the carburetor, or sometimes I adjust them even slightly higher so that uh, we get a better seal. Basically, it puts more pressure on that seat. This one looks pretty good for adjustment. I don't know. I'm going to call this one as good as I can get it for the moment and put it back together and try it. That's all we can do. All right, our carburetor is back on the machine here. I'm going to turn the fuel on and hopefully it doesn't go running everywhere. I ended up putting on the bottom half of the carburetor from the parts carb. As I said, that needle looked a lot better on that one for some reason. Really couldn't tell you why. It just looked like it lined up better. Let's give this thing a go. Is it ready? What do you think? We're going to make it? Getting bummed out here. Why do you keep dying? Give her again here. And that was something. I think we got it guys. This is by far the longest it's run yet. It's sounding pretty good. I gotta let it get warmed up all the way and then we can do some uh, fine tuning on that carburetor so that we don't have to fight it like this. After we got the carburetor dialed in I'd really like to change that oil before we attempt to go zipping around on this thing. This thing runs pretty good. It is a little smoky. This thing's old. I'm sure it's probably not the healthiest motor by the book. I'm sure the compression is not what it's supposed to be, but we're not gonna go take this thing out on a job and really move concrete with it. This thing is just a cool little go-kart for lack of a better word around here. Uh, I'm thinking it would, it would be quite the uh, conversation piece at a party if you filled the hopper with, you know, ice and beer. Let's, uh, it's definitely good and warm now. Let's go ahead and drain the oil out of this thing, put some fresh oil in it, and then we can finally try to take this thing for a spin. It's got a nice remote oil drain hooked up here, so all we should have to do is toss a pan under here. It is also quite possible by changing this oil we can reduce that smoke I was talking about. We're making a mess. Where's the pig mats when you need them? 
Dang it. Ah, pig mat here. Yeah, that's some black oil. We're gonna go ahead and let that drain for a while and put some fresh stuff in it and we're gonna try to take this thing for a rip. All right, we're all done draining out. That's the oil that came out of it. Let's put some fresh stuff in. All right, we got that thing full right up to the perfect spot. Now hopefully, hopefully it fires back up easy for us and we don't have to fight it and we can finally try to make this thing drive. There we go. Oh my golly, I think we got her. <laughs> I am irrationally excited about this thing. Uh oh. It's like a trick to figure out where you're going. <laughs> To go forward, you got to spin the engine all the way around now. Well, this is going to take some getting used to. <laughs> oh, we got to get this thing outside so we can open her up. this thing. All right, we got to do a top speed run because, you know, you got to do a top speed run with everything once you get it running. dangerously quickly. to get a workout running this thing all day. like two gears it's got this kind of like a creep gear and then when you really give her the beans it kind of takes off faster than you feel comfortable going on this thing we're gonna go try a little bit of off-road and see how she does
Well, we're learning things about our little unit here. Turns out you have to load the rear of the hopper heavier than the front. Who'd have thought? There could be some sort of easy locking system on that gear to keep it from doing that, but let me reposition our little buggy and it should help us out. <laughs> now that's a load. I don't know what she's really rated to carry, but we filled that hopper. We also kind of got the wheels partially buried over here. So if this thing pulls out of here, I'm going to be pretty darn impressed. Well, the tires seemed fine before, but with all that rock on there, they don't seem so fine anymore. Let's uh, throw some air in those things. Hopefully they don't blow up in our faces. Disappointing, there doesn't seem to be a way to inflate the inner tires without removing the outer tires, so we're going to neglect those for a moment. I tell you what, the thing actually handled the weight of that rock very well. It really didn't care at all. The trouble we're having now is it's not a liquid like concrete, or semi-liquid at least, so these rocks are just piling up in here. Even if it was smaller, fine gravel, it would probably flow out a lot better than this stuff. This is probably worst case scenario to haul in this thing, but I tell you what, it still beats the heck out of a wheelbarrow.
seems so easy. <laughs> well, I guess that's about it, guys. This thing runs, it drives, it operates. It's not really good for much other than concrete, and like I said, maybe holding some drinks at, uh, at a party in the future or something, but I think it's a really neat little contraption, and I think it's going to be fun to cruise around at the steam show with. I think, uh, I think it might turn into a merch wagon or something, maybe. Anyways, I know this wasn't some big piece of iron, but I hope you guys enjoyed the video all the same. If you did, let me know, leave a comment down below, and hit that thumbs up button for me. Really helps out the channel, doesn't cost you guys a dime. If you guys are looking to pick up any last minute Christmas gifts from the store, let's head on over to dieselcreek.com, place your orders today. This is your absolute last day cut off for the holiday season. If you want it there by Christmas, you gotta order by today. With that being said, I wanna thank you guys for watching as always, and I will catch you on the next one. Later.